Oh, you're missing a, you're missing both your nuts. Oh no, that one's got a nut. Um, the anatomy of a frozen shoulder. Having a bit of a stressful week because it's a supplementary exam week and kind of a busy one. So this is hopefully going to be a short thing, but frozen sol shoulder, oh, this is going to be so difficult to say. Frozen shoulder is a bit of a weird thing. Um, there isn't that much anatomy involved with it, but there is some, which is why I think it's going to be a short video, but it is something I often get asked about. What is frozen shoulder? What's the anatomy of frozen shoulder? What causes frozen shoulder? Um, how can it be treated? What do we need to worry about? And that sort of thing. So that's what we're going to do. <laughs> All right. The anatomy of frozen shoulder. The short version, um, this joint here, the glenohumeral joint, the upper limb articulates with the shoulder girdle here. There's, it's a synovial joint, there's a synovial capsule in frozen shoulder, the synovial capsule becomes tight, smaller, extra fibrous, um, which then restricts the movement of the joint. This process goes through a number of phases. It starts off as quite painful, which limits movement of the joint because of the pain. And then there's a period where the pain lessens off, but the joint is uh, less mobile, affects daily life, it's difficult to move your upper limb. And then it tends to resolve itself in the third phase. Um, but that whole thing can take between one and three years or even longer. Right, the detailed version. Frozen shoulder is also uh, sometimes called adhesive capsulitis, which possibly isn't the best name, but we don't really understand it all yet anyway. So uh, capsulitis refers to the synovial capsule. Itis says that it's been inflamed. That bit's probably correct. The adhesive bit turns out probably isn't correct. So the anatomy here, we've got the, um, we've got the scapula and it's the scapula that has the glenoid fossa, the socket of the ball and socket joint of the shoulder joint, um, the glenohumeral joint. So this is the humerus, this bone of the upper limb. So the glenohumeral joint allows the humerus to move around at its articulation with the shoulder joint. We've got the acromion, we've got the clavicle, and this being an articular cart uh, this being a synovial joint, the articulating surfaces are covered with articular cartilage. Um, that articular cartilage is nice and smooth. It's a great compressive load-bearing surface. If you've watched a lot of my videos, you'll know that I'm uh, a connective tissue nerd because of my research background. So this cartilage and the shape of the joint gives us a highly mobile joint. We'll talk about the movements in a moment and there's a lubricating fluid in here. It's more than just a lubricating fluid, but we can think of it as a lubricating fluid. Synovial fluid between those joint surfaces, a bit like an oil, keeping everything moving. So of course, if we've got fluid in here, we need to have a capsule to keep all that synovial fluid in the synovial cavity next to the articular cartilages and that capsule then that's surrounding the joint and keeping all that together is the synovial capsule and the synovial capsule is thickened in places just because joints holding things together and where we have thickenings of the synovial capsule we might call them ligaments and indeed there are other proper ligaments around here running from bone to bone so that's the anatomy and this is a right-sided joint. Here we can see the bones and a number of the ligaments. We can't actually see the synovial capsule as such, but you get an idea from these ligaments. You get an idea of what I'm talking about. You can, you can, pretty, you can see the capsule here, right? It's just opened up here and what. So the capsule is a connective tissue structure lined by a synovial membrane. It is complete around here. Um, and this is a, an indication of that. And you can actually see on this model, as I move the humerus, the capsule has to move to allow the humerus to move. Well, there's a clue. The movements of the humerus at the glenohumeral joint 
or you might want to think the movements of the, of the upper limb at the shoulder joint are, this is flexion of the humerus at the shoulder joint, extension, uh, excuse me, abduction, adduction, and then we also have uh, a rotation of the humerus. You've got to think about the, the humerus here spinning, right? So it spins around in that joint, right? So we have medial rotation of the humerus at the glenohumeral joint, lateral rotation of the humerus at the glenohumeral joint. Those are the movements that are going to be restricted by frozen shoulder. There are lots of muscles acting across the shoulder joint, moving the humerus. Frozen shoulder is not about these muscles. So what... Oh, it's coming apart. This is, that's a different type of injury. Um, so what causes frozen shoulder? Not sure. It occurs in people most commonly over the ages of 50 or 60. It's very rare in people under the age of 40. Um, it's more common in people that have diabetes, that have heart disease, that have had a stroke, that have Parkinson's disease. It's more common after um, the upper limb, the shoulder region has been immobilized maybe uh, you know, to repair the rotator cuff muscles or maybe um, to repair a bone fracture. So immobilization of this region can lead to frozen shoulder. So if you're a doctor, that's something you need to consider. It looks like um, there is inflammation of the synovial capsule, hence the capsulitis. And that leads to pain, which then leads to less movement of the upper limb and of the shoulder, which then seems to lead to fibrous changes of the connective tissue of the joint capsule. We see more type one and type three collagen in here. If you were to take a biopsy and look at the structures in here, um, the capsule becomes uh, thicker, tighter, smaller, so it actually shrinks. And this seems to be most evident in the anterior and superior parts of the synovial capsule. So given the anatomy that I've been talking about then, which of those movements is gonna be definitely restricted if the anterior and superior parts of the synovial capsule become tight and won't stretch anymore? It's gonna be that movement. So this is often described as, I've read this in a BMJ J article, um, this is often described as like a, um, a key feature of frozen shoulder is a, an inability to externally rotate or laterally rotate the humerus, even when passively assisted by somebody else, right? So that frozen shoulder, that tightening of the capsule, limits the movement of this joint in general, but in particular, it limits that external rotation. There are lots of, there's a lot of anatomy in the shoulder. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. So when you're trying to work out what is exactly going on in this shoulder, that might be a helpful diagnostic feature, right? So although the pathophysiology is not terribly well understood, how the disease progresses um, in terms of the patient's experiences are well documented. There are three phases. The first phase is the freezing stage, the freezing phase. So this is when pain starts to occur in the capsule, in the shoulder, leading to reduced use of this joint. So the pain causes less mobility at this stage. You don't wanna move the upper limb because it causes pain. So then you choose to move the limb less. This affects um, daily activities. And this can last um, three to nine months. You know, this is a slow process. So that leads to the second phase, the uh, frozen phase or the adhesive stage. And at this point, uh, the pain will likely lessen, but the 
joint is now less mobile because those fibrous changes in the capsule have occurred. So external rotation is now limited. That second phase, that frozen phase, can last four to 12 months. Um, but the good news is that in the third phase, which is known as the thawing phase, or the resolution stage, um, the joint starts to regain its mobility. Um, this can take six months, two, three, four years, so it can be very, very slow. But this problem, for most people, resolves itself on its own to one degree or another. Some people get the full range of mobility back, some people almost get the full range of mobility back, and some people get most of their mobility back with some restrictions. So frozen shoulder um, does resolve itself over time, but it can take a long time. So, is it an inflammatory condition? Is it a fibrosing condition? Is it something else? Don't know, which can then make treatment a little difficult. Um, but there are things that um, can be done. Maybe may, may the evidence is a little bit, you know. So how do you treat frozen shoulder? Uh, well, that's not my job. That's somebody else's job. I just teach anatomy. But given the things that we've talked about, if you're a doctor and you are considering immobilizing uh, somebody's uh, upper limb, shoulder joint, um, maybe because you are repairing a rotator cuff tear or because you're repairing a bone fracture, like other regions of the body, you do need to consider, okay, what are the advantages of immobilizing versus the disadvantages of immobilizing and what can we limit here? So we limit the risk of frozen shoulder. Frozen shoulder is more likely to occur in older people. So this is something you might consider in an older patient, but not worry about so much in a younger patient. I don't know, talk to an orthopedic surgeon, they'll know far, about that, far more about those considerations than I do. Um, but the recommendations are, you know, in that early freezing phase where pain is causing the restriction of movement, try to keep moving the upper limb. Let pain be the guide. So don't overdo it. Don't, you know, cause yourself pain, but keep moving the joint. And uh, pain relief then is an important aspect to that first phase, that, that, that freezing phase. Um, if it's an inflammatory condition, do anti-inflammatories help? Maybe, and probably again in that first freezing phase. Um, if we're talking about moving, does physiotherapy help? Maybe, physiotherapy may help keep this thing moving. Um, I think there are surgical release options as well for um, helping treat frozen shoulder. And like much of biology and like many disease processes, it kind of depends upon the individual person and the individual um, disease process, right? And the state of the condition as to what's best to be done. And that said, I think it's important to point out that as this, the patho pathophysiology of this process isn't very well understood, um, treatment guidelines and treatment advice and the research on treatment methods of frozen shoulder is likely to change in future years. So if you're in the UK, keep an eye on uh, the NICE guidelines for treating frozen shoulder. I'm just telling you um, the best thinking now. <laughs> Who knows how long this video is gonna be out there for? That could change. But in terms of the anatomy of frozen shoulder, that's what's happening. With, the fr the, with frozen shoulder, we're thinking about the glenohumeral joint, we're thinking about the synovial capsule. There seems to be a phase of inflammation leading to pain and uh, mobility of the up immobility of the upper limb because of that pain. And that then follows uh, fibrous changes to the synovial capsule, causing thickening, shrinking, and tightening, which then physically limits um, the mobility of the upper limb while the pain drops off, but then given enough time, it tends to sort itself out. But like I say, it's the shoulder. That's if it is frozen shoulder. The symptoms that you might be seeing in somebody might not be frozen shoulder. It could be something else. It's just one of the many things to, <laughs> to tick off to, you know, 
when you're trying to work out what's going on in a, in a shoulder problem, because shoulders are cool like that. Loads of good anatomy in the shoulder. Uh, right, that's it. Frozen shoulder, no doubt I've spoken far too much, but it's the shoulder. It's fun to talk about. See you next week.